In Math 114, you have learned so much material and you should be really proud of all the work you've put in this semester. But it's now that time where we prepare for the final exam and we look back at all 14 modules and we recognize, boy, that was a lot of stuff. And so we have 95 problems on the final exam review. I wanna help you go through the 95 problems and make sure that we're reviewing each of the things that could be on the final. Just know the final is not 95 problems long, so it is much more manageable, but we need to take, take a look at each type of problem we solved this year. First up, in the following situation, we want to state whether two variables are related in any way and in a way that might be described as a function, and if so, which one is the independent and which one is the dependent variables. Okay, so independent variable and dependent variables. Reminder that independent variable is our X usually, and dependent variables are Y, if we're using X and Y as our, our stuff. So let's look at a situation here. You have an expensive phone bill, and you wanna know how the cost of the bill depends. Okay, well, they kind of gave it to us here. They said depends. Okay, so that means we're gonna definitely have an X and Y relationship as a dependent. So it says the cost of the bill, that's one part, depends on the time you spent, okay? So which one is causing which? So which one depends on which, okay? So the dependent variable is the one that depends. So we say the cost depends on the time we spent. So in, in that way, it's actually telling us the dependent variable is what depends. Okay, what does it depend on? It depends on the independent variable. So this would be a function and it would depend on the amount of time you spend on the phone. So time on the phone is our independent and the cost is our dependent. Prorate the following expenses to find the corresponding monthly expense. Okay, this is to say prorate means that even if we don't have to pay a bill every month, it's good to set aside that money each month, okay? And that's the way we prorate expenses. So for example, if we pay a semi-annual premium of $550 for automobile insurance, that means we only pay it every six months, but we might wanna set aside how much it costs. So the first thing we have is $550 per six months. So I'm gonna divide that by six. The next thing we have is a monthly premium of 175 for health insurance, so that we don't need to divide at all. It's already in monthly. And the last thing we have is an annual premium of $500. So we don't have to pay $500 a month. We have to pay $500 every 12 months. And so that would be how we go ahead and get our answer. But make sure we round to the nearest cent because we're dealing with money. Use the four basic rules of algebra to solve the following equation. Don't get bug, bogged down by that terminology. All that means is, hey, don't break the laws of algebra. Don't break the rules. And so what we're going to try to do is make sure basic rules of algebra say, if we do something to one side of an equation, we do it to the other. So this is a something that's squared. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to work outward. So we're going to kind of peel away the outer layers as we work our way towards the inside. And what we're trying to get is the y by itself or y equals. So we're gonna start by square rooting both sides, but it's not quite that simple because when you square root both sides, it does cancel out the exponent that was squared, but we actually end up with a plus or minus on the other side, okay? So don't forget, whenever we square root, we always have to have a plus or minus. Now, when we multiply by two, we end up with y equals 10 or negative 10, either one of those. And if we were to plug them back in, you could see that if we plugged in 10 or negative 10, they would both give us the right answer. Calculate student loan of 15,000 at a fixed APR of 6% for 20 years. Okay, so we start with $15,000. That is our principal. We have an APR of 6%. Now, if we were to convert that to a decimal, I want you to understand that it's growing or is it shrinking until so we have an APR of 6%. Uh, we need to think about that in decimal terms. And the last thing we need is time. The time is 20 years. But I want you to notice what we're trying to solve first. The first thing we're trying to solve is monthly payment. Monthly payment. So 
a few things we need to do before we can solve our problem. The first one is to recognize that there is an Excel formula for this. You're allowed to use Excel in this course. So it could save us some time to go in Excel and type equals. Now our equals here, I believe is PMT because it says calculate the monthly payment. Okay. Now to calculate the monthly payment, we need to do a few things. One, it's going to ask us, it's going to ask us for the principal value. The principal value is our 15,000. Don't put it in with a comma or it'll bug out at you. It'll also ask you for the percent and it'll also ask you for the N per, which is the number of periods. Now the number of periods, that one is going to be not just 20 years, but 20 times 12 because we're not getting the annual payment, but the monthly payment. So it's actually going to be 240. The same logic when they ask for us, they don't say, what's the APR? They say, what's the rate? And what they're talking about is the rate for each month. It's not 6% per month. It's 6% divided by 12. Okay. So when we go to type this in and we type in the, the rate, the in per and the PV in our PMT function, we want to make sure that we're using this, the consistent amount in months. So we need to divide the rate to make it into monthly. And we also need to multiply by the number of months there are in a year to make the total number of payments. If we knew that the total amount we'd pay each month was a set amount, and let's just say for hypothesis, it's $200, okay? If we wanted to find the total amount paid over the loan, if this is our monthly, then all we'd have to do is multiply it by however many payments we're going to make, which in this case is 240. And the last thing it would ask is the percentage paid towards the principal and the percentage paid toward interest. So what we're going to want to do there is we're going to want to make a fraction of paid towards the principal compared to the original. And so on the bottom of our denominator, we're going to put the 15,000 and then whatever our total here is in, in, sorry, we're going to put the total on the bottom, which is going to be whatever we got there for part B. And then the principal was 15,000. Well, how do you know the interest? Well, it's still going to be out of the total, but the interest we're going to have to take and take the total and subtract what we started with. Okay. I would use Excel. That's just me personally, but there's also formulas that you can use for this. Okay. So check your notes on which way you prefer to do this problem. Write a short statement that expresses a possible relationship between the variables, a size of a diamond and the cost of a diamond. Okay. So the first question I have for you, okay, is which one comes first? Do you pick a price or do you pick a size? Which one comes first? Well, the truth is what's causing the other one? The size of the diamond is not something you change based on cost. The size of the diamond is our independent variable. The cost of the diamond depends on how big it is. That's one of the things it depends on. So what we can say, if we were to just kind of generally say it, as the cost goes up, the size also goes up. Now, if we put that, that is not the best possible answer, okay? The cost goes up, the size goes up because we put it in the wrong order. The independent variable should come first. So the better answer is to say that the, as the size goes up, then the cost goes up. Now to be fair, there's actually a flip way we could do this, right? We could do one more version. We say as the size goes down, then the cost would go down. They're in the same direction. So even if we said down, it still is a mathematical relationship. Identify the independent and dependent variables and describe the domain range. Okay. So first off, the independent variables are always our X value. It's also going to be where we look for domain, which means we have our dependent variables are our Y values. which means it's going to be where we look for our range. So let's look at how we'd actually say what our domain or range would be. So our domain would be, 
let's see, what possible value do we have for the domain? Well, we have the numbers 1950. And up until the year 2000. And I use square brackets. I use that notation. But I'm really just saying all the number, all the years between 1950 or 2000, that's what we're talking about here. The range, what we're going to do is we look on the left side and we say, where's the bottom and top of this? Okay. And it looks like it's about, about 2.2 billion. And it goes to about... Six billion. Consider this data. So we have this graph, and this is bar charts. Now it's bars, unlike a line chart, it means we just have each of these are representing separate categories. And in this case, our categories are different countries. We also have, these are a side-by-side -side bar chart, so we have two groups in each country. In this case, boys and girls, okay? So let's look at the kind of questions they ask us when we look at this that we wanna be able to analyze. The first thing we wanna look at is if we were to notice, it says that the bar graph from country E is more than twice as long as the bar graph from country D. So let's look at what that, that they're saying there. They're saying, Country E, it, for the girls, is more than twice as high as the bar for D. Does that mean they scored twice as high? So does that mean they scored twice as high? Well, let's take a look at what the scores represent. If we would continue this bar and look over here, is 540 twice as high as, I don't know, 490? No, no, it's not. So why is it not true that... E is twice as, scores twice as highly as D. Why does it look like it is when it's not true? And that's because the axis, okay? So it doesn't start at zero. Y axis doesn't start at zero, okay? So that's a big, big problem with the way we look at this graph. If we were to zoom out and put this starting at zero, these numbers are actually pretty close together. It's not nearly as spaced out as it might look when we're zoomed in right here. Part B says, assume that the data in the figure represents overall regional differences in performance. Okay, so the ups and downs are supposed to say, yeah, are we showing uh, something consistent? So, and it says, imagine that country G is right next to country F. So we have F and G. And G is in the same region as, uh, suppose country G is in the same region as B and F. So it's actually in B and F. So I'm looking at B and F, uh, B and F. And I wanna see what would I expect for the boys and girls to score in G if they have the same results as we saw in B and F. Well, what happened to B and F? Well, the boys and girls both scored pretty well, and the girls scored better. So I would expect in G that the girls would score a little better. When we're looking at data in a table, and we need to convert it to table to data in a graph, we need to be able to choose the data table and graph match that makes the most sense okay and so let me give you an example here this example we have years as our dependent variables so that's along the bottom and you'll see that that's actually true right it's along the bottom of both of these both of them are years okay and then we also have a median age and both of them say medium age so I want you to notice first off that the data is right. You don't need to go zooming in here. Obviously we can see that out of these two, the data is right. And so that's the first thing you need. If you're gonna have a good graph, it's gotta be the right data, okay, obviously. The other thing we gotta watch out for is did we pick the best graphical display for our data? And if we have years on the bottom, if we have years or if we have time, we're gonna usually use that right there. So if time is our independent and we're showing a change over time, we generally don't use bar graphs, 
Okay. So the question would then be, well, when do we use bar graphs? Because I feel like a lot of times we use time as our thing. Well, we use that when we have categorical data. In other words, is our independent variable or is the, our X a category? And in this case, it's not really a category. It's a time. So it's showing it's a number. It's quantitative. But if I had to split it up into, say, uh, different groups from different countries or from uh, different teams, then those are different categories, not the same group across time. Let's just define and distinguish among mean, median, and mode. So first up, mean is the average, okay? Now there's a few different ways we can talk about mean, but the big one is to just say we're finding the average. And that's actually our formula. If we're in Excel, we say equal average, and it'll calculate mean. And we just put the numbers we want. The second thing we need to know is the median, okay? Median is the middle. And if we're using Excel to find the median, we don't have to put them all in order and then you know find the middle number because there's a formula, it's called uh, median. So we type in equals median and then type in the numbers or we can select the numbers, that, the cells that the numbers are in. And our last category is mode. Now mode is the one that occurs the most, okay? So whatever number happens the most is our mode. So if they all tie, we might see if there's no mode, but there's actually a formula and I'm gonna guess I'm going to let you guess it is mode equals mode. And then we put the numbers in here. I want to give you a warning that there's, there's probably a couple versions of mode in Excel. Just know that that's meant to represent whether or not it counts ties and how it deals with ties. Okay. So our default is just equals mode. And what we'd say, if there's a tie and they all tie with having just one, we'd say there is no mode, but if there's a couple of them that tied to have the most, then we'd write both of those as our mode. Now, if I told you the distribution of grades was left skewed, distribution of grades was left skewed, but I told you that the mean and the median and the mode were all the same. What we need to recognize is that mean, median, mode are measures of central tendency. And so if we have a distribution of grades, since we're talking about grades, I'm gonna make a little bell curve, okay? And if I told you that the mean was right in the middle, and if I told you that the median was right in the middle, and then I also told you that the mode was right in the middle, then you would probably expect it to be symmetric. Okay, now when would it not be symmetric? Well, we could also have something left skewed. Now, what left skewed means is that the tail is longer on the left. So I'm going to show you a situation where the tail is longer on the left. This is left skewed because it has a long left tail. So in this case, I would say it doesn't really make sense to have the middle in all three of those be the same because as we were to pull the tail in one direction, that's gonna have an effect on the mean, median, and mode. Mean, median, and mode are three different things we can solve for. Now, rather than just type these numbers in a uh, formula and show you how to work them out by hand, I wanna to try to help you as much as possible with how we type them in Excel. So the first one is for mean, there's no mean formula in Excel, but we use equal, and then average. And then we just put our numbers in that formula. For median, the formula is equals median. Pretty fancy. And then put our numbers in there and it'll give us the median. And the last one, it'll be mode. And our formula is mode, okay? It might give us an error on mode if there is no mode. So I want you to notice if we were to look at this mode being the most common, so it might be 
no mode, which it is in this case, and it might give you, depending on which Excel version you're using, a different formula, a different result to your formula, but it'll probably say something along like NA or error here, because in this case, all of the modes tie. They only happen once. Describe the process of calculating a standard deviation. So I'm gonna tell you, I honestly, for standard deviation, I don't like to calculate by hand. We could certainly do it, but I need you to know these steps just in case they come up. It's something we talked about. Um, we did it by hand a couple times, but then we said, hey, we can use formulas. We can use Excel and say stdev.s for our formula and then put our numbers in, or we can use uh, Desmos and Desmos has an STD EV function. So there's a standard deviation function in Excel or in Desmos as well. So let's talk about the process. First, we compute the mean of the data set. That's what we'd have to do first. And then we find the deviation from the mean for every data value by doing what? Well, by subtracting the mean from the data value. Okay, so if we want to find the deviation, that's to say how far away from the mean it is. So we subtract the mean from the data value. And then the next thing we do is we square each of those. We find the squares of all the deviations. That would make them all positive. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether we were off on the low side or high side. And then what we do is we add all of those together. So we've found our deviations by subtracting, then we square it, and then we add. So we subtract, subtract, square, add. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna divide the sum by, in this one, is n minus one, okay? n minus one, or the other way to say that would be the total number of data values, n, the sample size, n minus one. We subtract one. The next thing we do, is we need to do one last thing because what we found at this point is the variance, but we need to find the standard deviation. So we have to square root this number. So an example would be that we could go ahead and do this whole process, but I want to tell you, rather than do this whole process, we use the stdev.s formula in Excel and type those numbers in, and then it will give us a number. We don't have to do all those many steps. We just need to remember which formula we're using in Excel. Now, I do want to mention if all the sample values were the same, if we plugged in, for example, 333333 and then press enter in Excel, what do you think the standard deviation would be? Well, how much does it deviate? If they're all the same, then there's zero deviation. So the standard deviation would be zero. Using this frequency table on the left, I want to look at which histogram is the best fit for this? Now, histograms are kind of like bar charts, except they represent data that is quantitative on the bottom. In other words, they're numbers, and they're numbers that have kind of like breaking points. So each one of these represents a bucket uh, that we're gonna fill up. Now, this one hopefully isn't too scary to you because we have the number zero for our smallest group from 20 to 29, zero actors. And that one has zero actors, but I want you to notice this one does not have zero in the first group, okay? The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the end. Now, the smallest, it seems to get bigger in the middle and then it tails off. So if I were kind of like sketch a graph of what this would look like, I'd say zero and then 10 and then 14 and then six would be less than that and three would be less than that, and two would be like that. So I just really quick was able to sketch representative of what this should look like. And so I think there's one that looks just like this. Okay, I think it's this one. You notice that the other ones kind of change directions on us, and so they throw us off a couple times. Compare A and B in three ways, where A is 1.6. So we're writing ratios here, and it just tells us what to do, except when we're writing ratios, we generally write them as uh, percents or fractions. There is that ratio where we have a colon, the two dots, like it looks like it's a time, right? But we're gonna go ahead and write these ratios as fractions in this course. So when we say ratio of A to B, what we're saying is put A over B, okay? And so all that needs us to do is type in 1.6, and I can not even type the million, I don't need it because they both have million, and 2.3. If I were to type million on the top and bottom, it would cancel out anyway. And then that would be my answer for part A.
For B, however, I need to flip it upside down because it says ratio B to A. So B has to go on top, 2.3 over 1.6. And the last part says A is what percent of B, okay? So A is what percent of B it means we take that ratio from part A and we turn it into a percent. Now, how do you convert this fraction, this ratio, to a percent? Well, all we have to do is type it into our calculator, get the decimal, and then multiply by 100, or move the decimal place too. The price of oil recently went from 720 to $12 per case of 12 quarts. Find the ratio of the increase in price to the original price. Okay, so it says the ratio of what? The ratio of the increase in price to the original price. So I've got two things I need. First thing I need is the increase in price. So what is the increase in price? Is the increase in price 12? No, that's the new price, but that's not the increase in price. So the increase in price is gonna be when we subtract those. So the increase is 12 minus 720 or 480. So that's our increase in price. So that's the first part. It also says it's the ratio of the increase in price to the original price. Now our original price was 720. So we're just gonna write this up just like this. And now we have our answer. At 3 p.m., Coretta's shadow is 1.43 meters long and her height is 1.85 meters. At the same time, a tree's shadow is 7.73 meters long. How tall is a tree? Now, to solve this problem, we have to represent, yes, it's at the same time, and we're talking about shadows, so let's assume they're at the same place. It doesn't say that. And this is a classic way that they found the circumference of the Earth. What they noticed is that when you have the sun casting shadows, each of the shadows make a similar or proportional shape, okay? So that's to say that each one of those ratios should be the same. So if Coretta's shadow to her height is 1.43 over 1.85, then that should match, that ratio should be equivalent. It should be proportional to the tree shadow. Now the tree shadow is 7.73. So I'm going to put that on the top because that's where I put Coretta's shadow. And it says, how tall is the tree? In other words, what's the tree's height? I'm going to put an X right there. And all we're going to do is we're going to cross multiply and divide to find that answer, just like we'd solve any other proportion. Suppose Y varies directly. It says directly with X. So first thing I need you to know is that a direct variation always goes to the point zero, zero. So first off, we know there's a point zero, 0, We also know there's a point 6.3 for y when x is 0 0.9. So that was a bit tougher to graph. 6.3, we'll go up there, and 0 0.9. So that'd be like right here. Okay. Now, if I'm doing this on the computer, it probably won't let me just put a point wherever I want. Okay. So direct, that is a terrible line. See, what I'm having trouble here is because I know two things about direct variation. I know that it goes through zero, zero. That's one thing. And also it's linear. It's a straight line. So I'm gonna use this to find my slope. And then my Y intercept, where does it cross the Y axis? At zero. So my equation is gonna be Y equals, and if I simplify that slope, I divide both of them by 0.9. I get y equals 7x. Now that's much easier to graph because I start at 0, 0, and I just go to 7, 1, or 1, 7. If g varies inversely as r, so it says g varies inversely as r, so g doesn't, it's not just kr, it's k divided by r. g varies inversely as r, and then we get a situation. We say, G equals 12. I don't know K, but it did tell me R is 2. Now, that's a pretty simple equation to go ahead and solve. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, and I get K equals 24. So now I can actually write an equation without having 
a k in it, but rather put the number. So that would mean my equation is actually going to be g equals 24 over r. And now it says find g when r is 8. r is 4. So I'm going to put a 4 in for r. And so I get g equals 24 divided by 4. So g equals 6. My g's actually look like 6s, so that can be a bit confusing. The distance for an object that falls directly as the square of the time. Distance of an object. So we have a couple things here that's telling us our, our formula right up front. It says the distance, that's D, varies directly, so KX. But it doesn't say varies directly with X. It says varies directly with the square of the time. Okay. So rather than just put X, I'm going to need to put the square of time. So I'm going to put T squared. So they've given us a formula to use. They then tell us the situation. They say if an object falls for three seconds, so that's situation one says T equals three, then it says it will fall for 144.9. So we can say D equals 144.9 feet. Now, it says, to estimate the height of the cliff, a person drops a stone at the edge of the cliff and measures how long it takes the stone to reach the base. If it takes 3.7 seconds, what is the height of the cliff? So our first situation they give us here, and then our second situation they say, they don't give us quite as much. They just say the T. They say T equals 3.7. What is the D? Okay. Now, to solve this problem, we need to remember that we have three things in a this variation problem. We have the D, the T, but we also have the K. And so to find our K here, we're going to need to plug in the two things we have and solve that equation for K. So if we do that, what we'd end up getting is 144.9 equals K times 3 squared or 9. Then we're going to divide both sides by 9 and we get K equals 144.9. 9 divided by 9. Okay, so that right there is our K. I'm going to leave it as a fraction just for funsies. You might want to clean that up and try to actually do the division, but I'm just doing this by hand, so I'm going to leave it just like that. So now that we have a K, it's the same K in the other one. So if we have two unknowns, or two knowns and one unknown, all we have to do is plug that into the same formula. So we'd say, well, we're going to plug in the T that we have and the K that we have. And that will give us our D. The weight of M, the weight M of an object on the moon varies directly. Yay, varies directly. So M varies directly, so I'm going to say k times x. Well, it doesn't say k times x, it says k times e, okay? So the first situation they give us is they tell us the weight on Earth. They tell us in situation one, they say the weight on Earth, e, is 153.82. And then they tell us the weight on the moon, so that's m, is 26.15. Our second situation, what do they tell us? Well, they tell us that they tell us an earth weight. They tell us E, 218.24. What they want us to find is the M. Okay. There's something missing, though, right? When we have a direct variation or an indirect variation or variation problem, we know the basics of the formula, but that means we need to find the missing piece. In this case, the missing piece is the K. In order to find K, what we're going to do is we're going to plug our M and our E back in. And so we're going to get 26.15 equals 153.82 times K. And so we're going to divide. And so we get K equals 
26.15 over 153.82. And you can type that in your calculator and try to clean that up. I'm just going to leave it just the way it is. Now, the nice thing about this is that since we have one formula, the K is called our constant of variation. So it is a, a constant. It doesn't change like our variables do. So we can use the same K right here. Which means to solve our problem and find m, all we need to do is go in and set up our equation, m equals 2615 over 153.82, and then we also have our e that we're going to plug in. Company XYZ closed at 99.86 per share with a P-E ratio of 10.91. So P-E ratio says P divided by E equals 99.86. Now they also told me the P. Did you notice that? They, they gave me the price. So P is the price, so we're gonna put 99.86 right there. And what they wanna know is what were the earnings? So to find E, I just need to solve this equation. So I'm going to go ahead and do that by multiplying by E and dividing. So E, oh, I wrote the same number twice. Please forgive me. The P-E ratio, I put 99.86, but P-E ratio is only 10.91. Okay, so to find E, we're going to need to swap out that, and we're going to get 99.86 over 10.91, and that is our earnings per share. Now the next thing it says, does it seem overpriced or underpriced or about right, given the historical PE ratio is 12 to 14? So the PE ratio right here, does that fit in there? No, it does not. That actually is too low. So we're gonna say it's underpriced. The average price of a low fare t airline ticket rose from 240, 240 in 1991 to 440 in 2006. So we're calculating the relative change in that price. Okay, so first off, how much did it increase? Relative change, we need to take into account how much it increased. Well, it didn't increase 440, it didn't increase 240, it actually increased $200. Okay, that's the, that's the increase in price because I subtract what I ended with from what I started with. And then I need to divide it by my original price. So if I type that in my calculator, I get 240 divided by, sorry, other way around, 200 divided by 240, I get something like 83%, okay? So the next thing it asked me to do uh, is to compare it to the overall rate of inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index. Okay, so the consumer price index is this table here on the right, and what it shows us is that we can pick years and see what the normal inflation was for those years. So the years we're talking about is 1991 to 2006. Okay, so it did go up. So we're going to use our formula where we take the numbers we have there. I'm going to use purple. And on the bottom, we know that we want our original number. So our original number was 136.2 in 1991. By 2006, it had risen to 201.6. So we're not just gonna write 201.6 on top. We need to subtract what we started with, 136.2, okay? And so if we type that in, we should be able to get another percentage of increase, right? It should be similar to what we saw with the ticket prices. So let's try it. As a fraction, we can go ahead and write 201.6. I'm typing in my calculator. That's why I'm saying it out loud to make sure I type in the right thing. One of the most frustrating things is when you do a problem correctly, 
and then type it in the calculator wrong. Uh, that's just the worst. Now, when I type that in my calculator, I got 0.48 or 48%. Okay, so guess what? The overall inflation rate, it went up 48%, right? But the ticket prices went up even more at 83%. When we look at this figure, what we have, we've got a few things in this problem and I don't wanna to get too bogged down on too much of it. So I want you to notice that we have a fixed monthly income of 3,500. And it also says that this couple spends 690 per month on healthcare, okay? So is that average? Well, we can calculate what percent of their income that is, right? Because we could say out of their, out of their $3,500 total, they spend 690 on healthcare. So we can find out what that would be. And that looks like it's about 20%, okay? Or if I wanted to be consistent with the table, I might do one decimal place. So that would be 19.7%. Now, if you look at the table, the question is, is that normal? And so we look down and we find healthcare. Healthcare is right here. And we pay attention to the fact that there's three different ones there. Uh, they're actually above all three of them, but I want you to notice they are 65 and older, so we should expect them to spend more than someone who's young, but they're above that 12% right there. A set of data items is normally distributed with a mean of 20 and standard deviation nine, convert 16 to a z-score. So for this, we're gonna need our z-score formula, or we can use uh, standardize. As if we we're doing it in Excel, we could use equals standardize. And we could give it those three numbers, 16, 20, and nine. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do it by hand because um, I want you to see it. Z-score, the formula is X minus mu over sigma. So if you know what each of these are, the X is the test score, the number that we're testing, 16. Mu is our mean, and so that's 20. And sigma is our standard deviation of nine. So we're just gonna type those in and see what we get. So if I type them in, I'm gonna type in my calculator here. I get 16 minus 20, and then on the bottom, I'm gonna put nine. And I got a z-score of negative 0.444 repeating. So I'm gonna leave it just like that. Data value in the 80th percentile. Now, if we have a percentile table, this is the one that they, they were using in the book here. So we have the 80th percentile. What we wanna look for is we wanna look for 80th percentile in our table. Now, 80th percentile is pretty close to right here. So we can say that our Z-score, our Z-score is at 0.85 for A. Our next one, it says, find a data value in the 60th percentile. So we look for 60th percentile, and that is right about here, pretty close. So for B, we're gonna say a Z of 0 0.25. And the last one we need to do is 54th percentile. Now 54th percentile, where is that? Oh, that looks pretty close to right there. So I'm gonna say C, the Z would have to be 0 0.10. Assuming that a test set of test scores is normally distributed with a mean of 80, so the middle is at 80, and a standard deviation is at 
So what that tells me is enough information to use a little bit of standardization. So to go, I'm gonna go standard deviation of five means I'm gonna go up five. So this would be 85. And I'm gonna go down five. So that would be 75. Now, let's run through a couple things here. The 68.95, 99.7 rule just says, hey, I need you to understand that one, if it's normal, it's symmetric. So the first thing we might notice is that half of it is less than 50, okay? That's the first thing we might notice. The second thing I want you to notice is with the 68.95, 99.7 rule, that if we go plus or minus one standard deviation, that right there is 68% of the data. So if I were to ask what's between 75 and 85, that's 68% of the data. Now, if I were to go a little bit further, instead of going plus, uh, plus five, minus five, what if I were to go another five and I were to go all the way to 90, and all the way to 70. So how much is between 90 and 70, okay? So since we've gone plus or minus two standard deviations, we say that our answer is 95. And then you'll notice that if we go all the way out to 95 and 65, in other words, if we go plus or minus three standard deviations, well, then that big amount is gonna be 99.7. Scores on this quantitative proportion of an exam have a mean of 572 and a standard deviation. So they give me a couple things. They say that the mean is 572 and a standard deviation of 148. And it says, what percentage of students taking the exam scored above 690? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our X is going to be the 690. That's what, 609, sorry. That's what we're looking at here. So we need to convert that into a Z score. So we're going to say Z equals 609 minus 572 all over 148. So I'm going to type that in my calculator and see what I get. I got a z-score of 0 0.25, okay? Notice I didn't get a negative. I just got a 0 0.25. So what I want to do is I want to look in my z-score table to find that z-score. And that's not too bad. I actually found it already. It's right there. And so it gives me a percentile of... 59.87. Now, the truth is that that percentile is the percentage below. And the question asked, what is the percent above? So we're going to have to say subtract from 100 minus 59.87. And that would give us about 40% above. To take a little bit bigger look, we're taking 12 weeks to blank minutes. So we're going to start writing it out. What are we starting with? We're starting with 12 weeks. Where are we headed? We're headed to minutes. And so we're going to fill in the middle with our conversion factors. The first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to cancel out weeks with week. And so one week, how can we make that into minutes? I don't know how many minutes are in a week, but I, I can make it smaller. Minutes is getting smaller, so I want to make it smaller. What's smaller in a week? days. There are seven days in one week, so that's what I'm going to use for my conversion factor. Now, at this point, I want to connect days to minutes. Again, I don't really know how many minutes are in a day, but I do know I can keep making it a little bit smaller. So one day is 24 hours. And then finally, I can get to minutes because I can cancel out hours with minutes. So I know that one hour is 60 minutes. Now, at this point, all three of these conversion factors in the middle 
are equivalent to one. Seven days is equal to one week. They're the same on the top and bottom in value. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply straight across the top and straight across the bottom. And since the bottom is just one, we don't really have to divide by one. And so what we end up with is 120,960 minutes in 12 weeks. Notice that we wanted to put however we needed to do to cancel out our units. The only units left is the one we wanted to be left. Converting measurement, when we're talking about from metric to customary, we're going to want to use a conversion factor. So in this one, we've got a couple we can use. We're converting from 23 pounds to however many kilograms. Now, we have two conversion factors that they connect pounds and kilograms. You could use either one. We just want to use whichever one uh, makes sense for the situation. Either one would work. We just want to make sure that if we're going to convert to kilograms, that means we want to cancel out pounds. So we're going to put the one pound on bottom. You could have put the 2.205 pounds. We could have used this one, but instead I just use the one pound on bottom. That way I'm just dividing by one. And on the top, I'm going to have the kilograms. It tells me that. So I'm just putting my conversion factor right in there. We're going to multiply that. And guess what we get? We get 10.4328 kilograms over one. Remember, pounds have canceled out. And so the reason I picked to put it over one is because now I can just say, boom, 10.43 kilograms is my answer. Converting the following temperatures from Fahrenheit to Celsius or vice versa is one of our basic skills that we need to do because we live in a world where some countries like the United States use Fahrenheit and some countries like Australia use Celsius. And so we need to be able to use either one of these formulas, but what we're just going to do is we're just going to plug them into those formulas to get the other thing. So if we have Celsius and we want Fahrenheit, we're going to plug it into the Fahrenheit formula. And if we have Fahrenheit, we're going to plug it into the Celsius formula. So for example, A would be C, the Celsius for A would be 25 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 over 1.8. Now, if we're going to use something like C of negative 20, I want to convert that to Fahrenheit. So we're going to say Fahrenheit equals 1.8, and I have negative 20 for my Celsius plus 32. And that, whatever that calculates to, is going to end up being our answer. Let's look at another conversion one. Now this one's a little involved because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take what we have, which is one liter and 23 kilometers, that's in our problem, but our problem actually also tells us another fact. It tells us that there's 125 or 1.25 euros per liter. So there's two facts that they give us. And what we're looking for, when we have two facts like that, we're just gonna treat them just like we would conversion factors. What we're trying to turn it into is dollars per 200 kilometers, okay? How many dollars would it take to go 200 kilometers? So let's see how we would go from liters and euros. Now, the nice thing is, since I already have two things, I can pick, I put liters on bottom just so it cancels out because I don't want liters in my answer. But if I just take that, I would end up with euros and kilometers. I want it in dollars. So I'm gonna use my conversion factor for dollars and euros, one euro is 1.256 US dollars. So now I can cancel out my euros. And from there, I'm just gonna multiply straight across. Now this time I didn't have just one on the bottom the whole time. I actually had 23 times one times one. So at this point we get 1.57 US dollars is how much it would cost to go 23 kilometers. But I don't wanna know how much it costs to go 23 kilometers, I want to know how much it go, costs to go 200 kilometers. So what we need to figure out is what do we need to multiply 23 by to get 200? And so I just did the quick division here and I ended up with 8.696. That's what I need to multiply by because I just divided 200 by 23. That means I need to multiply it by 8.696 to get to 200. And then I would get the answer to my question. I want to know how many uh, dollars for 200 kilometers. But in order to do that, I also need to multiply it on the top and the bottom by the same amount. And so 
In addition to the kilometers being multiplied by 8.696, the dollars are also multiplied by 8.696, which means our final answer on this one is $14.08. Convert to Fahrenheit. This is another convert to Fahrenheit. They have a slightly different formula. It's just written differently, but it's really the actual same formula if we were to move things around. This one actually gives us Celsius, and we want to convert to Fahrenheit, so we're going to use the Fahrenheit formula. Fahrenheit equals 9 over 5 times Celsius. In this case, we got negative 50 plus 32. And from here, we can go ahead and do a little bit of math, and I get negative 50 and that would be negative 90 plus 32 and so I get Fahrenheit for negative 50 Celsius is negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Scale ratios for maps they usually tell us one centimeter to one kilometer, whatever. You'll see it written on a map that we say, well, one centimeter on the map represents 100 kilometers. Mm -hmm. But a scale ratio should be written or could be written without units at all, okay? And the way we do that and the way we create a scale ratio is we convert both of them to the same unit. So one centimeter and 100 kilometers, if I wanted to convert them to the same unit, I could convert them both into meters. So one centimeter is not as big as one meter, right? They're different. A centimeter is smaller. In fact, I'd have to divide by 100. And so I get 0 0.01 meters is one centimeter. 100 kilometers, that's more than a meter. So it's not just 100 meters, it's 100,000 meters. hundred kilometers, each kilometer is a thousand meters, so that's a hundred thousand meters. Now, so what is our ratio? When we have these two, I would prefer it to be the ratio of one to something. So I want the first number to be a one. Right now, the first number is not a one because it's 0.01. What do I need to multiply by? I'm going to multiply by a hundred, which means I'm also going to multiply by a hundred on the other one. So it's one to a 10 million ratio. So everything has been shrunk, shrunk down. 10 million is shrunk down to just one. So 10 million, 10 million centimeters is shrunk down to just one centimeter, or 10 million meters is shrunk down to just one meter. Let's look at another one. This one is a little bit less of a crazy scale. We have one centimeter and 50 meters. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna try to convert this into the same thing. Since this is already in centimeters and it's already one, I'm going to try to convert this one to centimeters, okay? So how many centimeters are in each meter? Well, there's 100 centimeters in one meter. So in 50 meters, I'm going to do 50 times 100. So there's 5,000 centimeters in 50 meters. And so our ratio here is 1 to 5,000, okay? So what we're saying is the scale is 1 5,000th. Let's look at another scale ratio problem, but this one's a little bit different. This is one of those things that you might see in a documentary where they talk about the earth being really, really old and human written histories not that old. And so the first question says, suppose the entire history is represented by a 10 meter long timeline. What is the distance that represents 1 billion years? So the entire history is 10 billion. So I would say 4.5 billion that's 10 meters and the follow-up question is well what is 1 billion meters or 1 billion years it's not 1 billion meters it's going to be less than 10 meters and so all we're going to have to do if we don't find x meters notice that my billions of years and my meters line up they're in the same place and we're going to solve that proportion by going ahead and cross multiply and divide. So we get 4.5x equals 10. And so x equals 10 divided by 4.5. Now that's part A. Part B says how far from the end of the timeline does human written history begin? Now human written history is not a billion years. It's only 
10,000 years. Now my problem is I can't just go ahead and cross multiply and solve this one as it sits because this one is written in years and this one is written in billions of years. So we're gonna make them both into years. So instead of saying 4.5 billion years, we're gonna say 4, 500, That'd be 4.5 million, but I want 4.5 billion. And then we can cross multiply and divide, okay? Talking about mortality rate, suppose that that many people died and the population of a country is this much. They wanna know what is the mortality rate in deaths per 100,000. So the way we do that is we do the total population we do the group that we're looking at, which in this case, the deaths. And whatever we get, instead of just saying that ratio, we want it per 100,000 people. So we're gonna multiply those together. And so deaths is gonna be 586, 250, divided by 264 million. Again, pay attention that we're writing in the same units. 264 million means I'm gonna go ahead and write one, two, three, one, two, three. So I've got 264 million written out. And then I'm gonna multiply it by 100,000. And when we type that in our calculator, we end up getting the answer we're looking for. Instead of the following exam question, so this is one where somebody has already solved it. And they, they said they went into a candy store that sells chocolate for $7.01 per pound. And they wanna buy just a piece of it, okay? They don't wanna buy $7 worth of chocolate. And so they look at how much they have and they've only got 0.17 pounds. And so their math is that it'll only cost them 2.4 cents before tax. And they think, oh, I'm just gonna give them two cents. Now the question is, is that the right answer? Well, no, that's wrong. The follow-up is, why is it wrong? Or how would you do that the right way, okay? So they did something wrong because two cents for chocolate is too cheap when they're selling it for $7 a pound. We need to make sure that we're selling it for the appropriate representation. So I'm gonna do this with a proportion. I'm gonna say $7.01 per one pound. And this time we have how many pounds? 0 0.17 pounds. Notice I put the pounds with the pounds. They're both on the bottom. And what I want to know is what is my dollars right here, okay? And we can cross multiply and divide. So if you look at what they did, they actually took 701 and they divided 0.7 when we should have multiplied. Let's look at an electricity problem. We have the company called charges 15 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity. So the first part we have is, let's say we have a light bulb and the light bulb is a 60 watt light bulb. And that means it uses 60 watts each hour. And then we use it for 13 hours each day. So I'm gonna go ahead and figure out how much electricity it uses in a day. So I do 60 watts times 13 hours. And I end up with 780 watts hours okay they told me that they're going to charge me 15 cents per kilowatt hour so if i multiply that by 0.15 per cents per kilowatt hour you'll notice that it actually doesn't cancel out because we have watt hours on the top and kilowatt hours on the bottom so we need to kind of do some math here okay so what's the difference well, the difference is that a kilowatt is a thousand watt hours, okay? So in other words, we can also say that 780 kilowatt hours or watt hours is equal to 0 0.780 kilowatt hours. And then we can multiply that by that 50 cents. And what we're going to get is that it costs us 
you know, a few cents a day, let's say 11 or 12 cents a day. You'll notice that if we wanted to save money, we could replace our 60 watt light bulb with an LED bulb that is just as bright, but it only uses 10 watts. Okay, so how much would we save? Well, if it only uses 10 watts and we're using 60 watts, we're going to save 50 out of 60. We're going to save five sixths of our costs. So in order to calculate it, we're going to go ahead and multiply our cost per day times 365 days in a year. And that would give us our total cost for the year. But we're actually going to save most of that because we're going to switch to a more efficient light bulb. Assume that when you take a bath, you don't fill it all the way to the brim because otherwise if you did, when you got in, it would overflow, right? So let's assume you fill it halfway. Now, if you have a tub that is five feet by three feet by 2.1 feet, then you only fill it in halfway. And so we need to pay attention to what measurement is half. But the truth is either one, any one of those can be halved and it would still work, you know? So what we're gonna say is um, five times three times 2.1, but we're only gonna multiply that by one half. And that should give us how much water we use, okay, when we take a bath. Now, this probably shouldn't surprise you. I, I think we're going to end up using less water if we take a shower. So let's first find out how much water we use if we take a bath. So we're going to type those numbers in our calculator. 5 times 3 times 2.1. And then we're also going to multiply it by 1 half. And I got... 15.75 now that's in feet and actually it's in cubic feet so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at when we take a shower now it says when you use a shower you have 181 or 1.81 gallons per minute and you spend eight minutes so that's just 1.81 gallons times eight minutes and you would end up with do my math, eight times 1.81, you would end up with 14.48 gallons. So at first glance, you go, uh-oh, we use more water, but it's pretty close. But it's not close when we actually look at the fact that when we're looking at our units, we have gallons and feet cubed, but one cubic foot is actually seven and a half gallons. So we need to do one last thing. If we want to compare these fairly, we need the same units. So I'm going to multiply this by the 7.5 gallons per cubic feet. Now, when I do that, notice that the cubic feet cancels out because we have a top and bottom. And so we end up with, typing it in my calculator. It's okay to use a calculator. That's not a sin. I end up with, 118.125 gallons okay so do you use more water taking shower or bath well definitely taking a bath and how long would you need to shower in order to use as much because you just showered for eight minutes this means you could take longer showers and still save water so let's think about this for a second if we wanted it to be equal like a crazy person uh then we could say well each minute i use 181.81 gallons per minute, how many minutes do I need to multiply that by so that it equals 118.125 gallons? That's a pretty simple equation to solve. What we're going to do is we're just going to divide it um, by... <laughs> so we're going to take what we have here for our answer. We're going to divide it by the 1.81. And I got 65.3 minutes. So I got good news, guys. If you want to save the planet, you have to uh, take showers. And they have to be at least less than 65 minutes.
to end up with the units of speed, when we talk about speed, what do you need? Okay, so when I say speed, what are some examples of speed? Well, we've got miles per hour. You might also have uh, meters per second. You could have, what's another speed measurement? Um, kilometers per hour. And so what I want you to notice is that whenever we have speed, that is distance, how far you're going, divided by time. So speed is the measure of how far you go and how quickly it how quickly you get there, okay? To end up with the units of speed, when we talk about speed, what do you need, okay? So when I say speed, what are some examples of speed? Well, we've got miles per hour. You might also have uh, meters per second. You could have, what's another speed measurement? Um, kilometers per hour. And so what I want you to notice is that whenever we have speed, that is distance, how far you're going, divided by time. So speed is the measure of how far you go and how quickly it, how quickly you get there, okay? In a certain country, the life expectancy for women in 1900 was 47 years. And then it turned into 80 years. So it went from 47 to 80 years. So it went up. How much did it go up? So it went up 33 years. I just subtracted those, right? So what percent increase happened? Well, our percent increase that happened, what we need to do is we need to take our new minus our old, 80 minus 47, and divide by our old or our original amount. And if we do that, we end up with the 33, the amount it went up, divided by 47. Okay, so it's, sorry, I'm going to use my calculator here. That's going to give me my percent increase. If I use my calculator, I get 33 divided by 47. And so that's 0 0.70 or 70%. Okay, now here's the catch. If it says, it says it's going to keep increasing for another 100 years, if it keeps in increasing at the same rate, does that mean it's going up the same number of years? Does it go up 33? Well, no, because it's not going up by 33 years each time. It's going up at the rate of 70%. And so we need to figure out what is 70% of that 80. So we can do that pretty quickly by doing 80 times 0 0.70, and so that's 56 years. So does that mean that the life expectancy will be 56 years? No, that means we add 56 years, and so that we end up with 136 years. Suppose that a certain basketball game, the athlete earned 23,500,000 to play 80 games, and they only take 48 minutes to play a basketball game, assuming they don't go to overtime. How much did the athlete earn per game? So first, we'd say, well, this is easy math. We just say they took the 23,500,000 and divide it by 80, because that's, that's how much money they made per game. However, the athlete might say, well, it's not quite that simple because uh, I played every minute of those games. And so we might need to say, okay, so if that's how much they made per game, then we take that and we're going to multiply that by or divide that by 48 because that's how much they made per minute. All right, but some athletes don't even play the whole game. They only play two thirds of the game. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, I don't need to divide it by 48 minutes. Instead, I'm gonna take that amount and I'm gonna divide it by 
two thirds of a game. So two thirds of 48 is 32. So they only played 32 minutes. Well, then we're going to divide that and that will give us that. Now, the last part is that the athlete will say, no, 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 no. You can't just say for the minutes I was there because I worked for every game. And let's say that on average, they practiced for 33 hours and played every minute. What would their hourly sal salary be? Okay, so we're going to work this out here. So how many total hours did they work? Well, for each game, let's factor this down to hourly salary. So they started with this much money for the year, but that's for 80 games. Okay, but each game cost them 33.8 hours. Okay, why 33.8? Because of 33 hours for every game in practice plus the 48 minutes or 48 out of 60 for the time they played in the game. First glance, this looks more difficult than it is. We've got 160 micrograms and it's in solution, okay? So we have 160 micrograms, that's what we want to give. We want 160 micrograms. But the drug is 500 micrograms per milliliter. So the question is, how many milliliters should be given? So again, this is, looks really complicated, but when we write down what we have and what we're looking for, this is really just a straight um, division problem. So we end up with 160 divided by 500 or 0.32 milliliters. Let's take a look at the metrics that we can use in different situations. It's important that we know our metric units, okay? So a few of the ones right off the top of my head are millimeter and centimeter. You sometimes see decimeter, but we're not gonna use that one too much. We're gonna say meter. You might even see kilometer. And those are big metric distances, okay? But I want you to know that there's the other ones that we could have all the same prefixes with weights And you should have a, a roundabout guess about how big each one of those is. For example, a paper clip is probably going to be measured in millimeters. It's really small. And a width of a dime, probably millimeters. You could maybe say centimeters. A dime might be a centimeter wide. I don't know. The If we're talking about the width or the thickness, then thickness should be definitely millimeters, right? A tall floor lamp, a tall floor lamp might be measured in meters. It could be two meters tall. The width of a room would be meters, usually. The A road race, so if you're racing on the road, you would expect it's probably with cars or bikes, so we're going to say kilometers. The wingspan of a butterfly is probably in centimeters, probably fair enough, but you might even say an eagle is in centimeters or in meters. I think eagles can get pretty big, so I'm going to say maybe in some meters. Shoe size, a meter would be too big. Everybody has shoes that are less than a meter big, so we're going to say a little bit smaller, centimeters. The width of a window, again, a meter is probably too big to measure most windows, but there are some windows that it's not too big, so depending on the situation. Now, I want to stop for a second and focus on this last one, because when we start talking about different dimensions, we talk about floor space of a tent. You might say floor space of a tent, it could be three meters by two meters, and so you could say it's meters, but the truth is it should be meters squared because when we're talking about area we want squared dimensions if we're talking about volume we want cube dimensions so i want you to watch out for that i don't want you to get it wrong just because you picked the right but you weren't paying attention to 
the units and the dimensions. House, 21 meters by nine meters. Okay, so we've got a house and it's a rectangle. And it's 21 meters by nine meters. And I can find the area of that house. I multiply those two together and I get 189 meters. Again, we just want to remember that that's the second dimension. So 189 meters squared. Now, the question is actually saying, listen, we have this house, but we also have a walkway around the whole house. And so that walkway around the whole house kind of gives us a bigger rectangle. Can you kind of see how, if we imagined that the whole house had like a big rectangle if it continued the walkway underneath the house, like the concrete, then we could have a bigger rectangle. So the question is, how big is that bigger rectangle right now? So if the walkway is only 1.2 wide in this range, but we notice it's 1.2 wide on both sides, 1.2 plus 1.2, that's 2.4. So it's 2.4 meters that it's adding to each of our dimensions. So our rectangle is gonna be 21 plus 2.4, so that's 23.4 meters, and nine plus 2.4, so that's 11.4 meters. And so our big green rectangle, if we were to fill in the whole thing, would be those multiplied together. So I'm gonna get out a calculator because I don't know that off the top of my head. So I'm gonna say 11.4, times 23.4 and so the big one I got was 266.76 and it's going to be meters squared because we're talking about area. So what is the question? The question is find the area of the region covered by the house and the walkway. Well guess what? That is what we just found. But let's say we don't want to include all the part that's both green and red. Let's say we want to take this part out. Well, how are we going to find that? So for part B, all we're going to do is we're going to take that 266.76 and we're going to subtract the 189 that the house is covering. And that would give us our answer for B. It's still going to be in meters squared. Let's look at a confidence interval one real quick. We don't need to go into super depth on confidence intervals. As we get deeper in statistics, yeah, we can do some more confidence intervals. But in basic terms, what we want to say with confidence interval, you hear these all the time, is you say, yeah, we're going to make an estimate. So let's say the estimate is 45%. And then we say that there's an error. We're not necessarily, we've done it, we've done a sample, we uh, did a study, but we're not sure that it's exactly 45 percent well, we're pretty sure and so what we can say what we can say is that we can give our error and in this case it says plus or minus four points and so that means our confidence interval is actually going to be from 41 to 49 percent now that is not the answer to this question because i'm just telling you what a confidence interval is confidence interval gives you the answer in a range, it says between these percentage points. Now, why is that not the answer? Well, that's not the answer because we're answering the wrong question. So when we look at this problem, it says the majority of people are not in favor, not in favor of legalized abortion. And so what we need to do is we need to look at the percent that is not in favor of legalized abortion. But That 45% was in favor. So our actual percentage that we're going to use is 55% because that adds up to 100 are not in favor. And then we can subtract and add our four. So we're going to end up with 51% to 59%. This is an example of the type of solving um, an unknown value in a percent proportion. So the setup is going to be part over whole equals percent over 100. So for, let's start just by saying we have part, we have percent. So let's fill it in. We have 10 over whole equals percent is 2 
over 100. So the part I don't have is whole. So I'm going to put an X right here. That's the part I don't have. And now we're going to solve this proportion like we do any other proportion. I'm going to go ahead and multiply these and these. And I'm going to get 2X equals 1,000. And then I'm going to divide by 2. And I get X equals 500. So remember, we're multiplying diagonally the ones that aren't a variable. And then we go ahead and divide by our coefficient there. Let's try it again. This time we're finding the whole, okay, just like last time. And we know that the part is 63. So I know that's on top. And the percent is 15. And percents are always over 100. So what I don't know is I don't know this whole. So I'm going to cross multiply and divide. And so if I do that, what I'm going to get is x equals 63. 100 divided by 15. And then if it wanted as a decimal, I could go ahead and just type that in as a decimal and get it my answer. Pay attention to what you're, you're looking for on this. If you're looking for a decimal or a fraction, just pay attention to what it's wanting. For this one, it looks maybe like a little bit different setup, but I want you to notice we have 160%. So we're still going to go 160 over 100. We have percent. And then it says of 300 miles. So we need to match up that percent side over here. So where are we going to put the 300? Well, our, our trigger word is that of, okay? The of kind of gives us a hint that the 300 is what matches up with the bottom, okay? 300 would match up with 100. So now we go ahead and put an X on top. From there, we can cross multiply and divide. And we end up with X equals 480. In the following statement, express the first number as a percentage of the second number. So the first number they give us, boom, 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 41, 200. And the second number they give us is that one. So we're just going to write them as a fraction first, because to convert this into a percentage, we're going to take that fraction. We're going to type it in our calculator, 41. We could do it by hand, but I'm going to save myself uh, the embarrassment of getting it wrong on video and just type it in my calculator. And then that's going to give us a decimal of 1.173789 blah 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 blah. Okay? The question says write it as a percentage of the second number. So the first number is 117% of the second number or 17% more. All right, we've got some ratios in words. These are some basic ones. 33 out of 100. That's a ratio in words, but we could write that as a fraction as 33 over 100. So as a decimal, if we type that in our calculator, we get 0.33. As a percent, we get that 33%. When we look at 55 out of 100 or 0.55, as a percent, again, we just move it two decimal places. So we say 55%. And as a fraction, we could write it as 55 out of 100. Now, if we had to simplify that fraction, we could do it, okay? Because we could take 5 out of the top and bottom, and that would give us 11 over 20, which is our simplified form. 33 over 100, we didn't need to simplify because nothing went into both of them. 12 out of 100, okay? As a fraction, we could obviously write 12 out of 100, but we could also simplify because we could take a 4 out of the top and bottom, and that would give us 3 out of 25. Oh, not 24, 25. Now, as a decimal, we want to think back at that 12 out of 100 means we're going to put it 0.12. And as a percent, that's going to be 12%. Okay, so working in and out of fractions and decimals, we sometimes have to do the extra step of simplifying the fraction, but it's pretty straightforward. Compute the total cost per year of the following pair of expenses. And then we're going to complete the sentence on an annual basis. The first set of expenses is blank percent. So first, Maria spends $19 on lottery tickets every week. There are 52 weeks in the year. So her total spending for the year is going to be $19 times that 52 weeks. So that's a decent amount of money. Let's see if she, what if she's thought about how much she's spending on this. So that's $988 total. 
but she's also spending money on food okay so guess what that's she spends even more money on food but to do the food one you need to recognize that it's not 52 weeks there's only 12 months so we're gonna write the 121 times 12 and that gives us 1,452. Okay, so she does spend more money on food uh, than lottery tickets. Not much more, but she does. And it says first as a percent of the second. And so we're just gonna write that as a percent by writing them as a fraction. And so that's gonna be 988 divided by that 1452. And what we get is a decimal and we convert that to a percent and we get 68%. She spends more than half as much on lottery tickets as she does on food. Complete the following sentence. The main span of bridge A is blank percent shorter, percent shorter than the main span of bridge B. Okay, so the first thing we need is to recognize that we're looking for the percent shorter. So how much shorter is bridge B than bridge A? So that's 4,100 minus 2,600. And then we're gonna divide it by the number on the bottom. What should go on the bottom? Well, it's gonna go the second thing. The bigger number is gonna go on the bottom. If we didn't put the bigger number on the bottom, we could get some really ridiculous answers. <laughs> like uh, it's 200% shorter. Well, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, you could say a bridge is uh, half as long, you know, but to say anything more than that would be a bit funky. Determine whether the following claim could be true. So let's say I made a claim and I said, you just need to do this. If you want to save money, you turn off the lights and close your windows at night. Um, make sure you turn off all your lights and close your windows so you don't like lose air. And you could save 113% on your energy bill. Okay, so that means if you were paying $100 on your energy bill each month, then you'd save 113%, or in this case, $113. Congratulations, your bill is now in the negatives. Does that make sense? Uh, no, you, you can't really have a negative energy bill, especially not by just uh, turning off your lights at night. You're not going to you know, you're not going to completely eliminate your electricity usage uh, that way. Vacuum cleaner sold 370 units in 2011 and 393 in 2012. It says find the percent increase or decrease. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the new, which is 393, subtract the old, which is 370, and divide by the old. Okay. Now, when we do this, what we're doing is we're not calculating, uh, we're just calculating the percent increase. So by subtracting by 370, what we really have in the numerator is we're accounting for those 28 more vacuums sold, sorry, 28, 23 more vacuums sold um, when we subtract those. So 23 out of how many? Out of 370 the year before. And so that comes to about 6% increase. Let's look at another example with uh, percent and percent increase. And the point I want to make with this problem is the difference between a percent change and percentage points. So we have an absolute change in percentage points and a relative change in a percentage. Now, a lot of times you'll hear stats on the news and they won't really specify whether they're talking about an absolute change of percentage points or a relative change of a percentage. We use this when we have percents that we're talking about. So in this case, it went from 68 to 82. So we're gonna go ahead and take the 82 and subtract what it started at, at 68. And that would give us 14. Now that's 14 percentage points increase. That is not an increase of 14%. So that's a percentage point increase. I just subtracted. So in absolute terms, that's 14 percentage points. Notice I didn't write the percent symbol. Now in relative terms, I take that absolute and I divide by what I started with. And when I do that, that percent is what's going to go right in there. I'm going to go ahead and use my calculator and figure this one out. I'm pulling out my handheld calculator. 
14 divided by 68. And I got like 20.20588. And it kept going. But I need to round it to the nearest tenth. That means one decimal place. So after I multiply by 100, I'm going to get 20.6%. So notice that those are different because percentage points are not the same as a percentage. This is one of those deceptively tricky problems. So I want to show it to you because usually the first time you look at this problem, you might think about it backwards. And that's because it's written backwards. So it says the diner's frequency is at a 15% temp. And so when we go ahead and pay, if we got and we price the meal and we charge 31.05, including tip, that's including tip. How much was the tip? Okay, so if that's including tip and we want to know how much was the tip, we can set up a percent problem. But I want you to notice this is not 15%. Okay, if we set it up as 15% over 100% and we try to find this, what we're going to find is that we were charged 3105, but it actually costs us hundreds of dollars to eat this meal. And that's that's not true. Okay, so what are we missing? We're missing the fact that 3105 is not just the tip. It's not just the percent of the tip. It's also the whole meal. So we need to put that 3105 equal to 115%. Now when we set this up and solve, we're going to go ahead and cross multiply and divide. And when we do that, I got $27 even, okay? Now, so my answer is $27. Well, actually it's not $27 because I was trying to set this up and I wasn't paying attention to what I'm looking for. So whenever I have a word problem, I like to check before I submit my answer. I look at what was the question actually asking? And if you look at the question, the question was how much was the tip? Do you think that we tipped $27? No. That's too much. That's not the tip. That's 100%. What I need to find out is what the 15% was. In other words, I could either go reset this up and change this right here to 15% instead of 100%. I could do that. Or I could take what I have here and subtract it from 3105. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the 3105 and I'm going to subtract 27. And what I ended up with is a tip of $4.05. Now, when we talk about statistics, it can be very easy to misunderstand what's being said. Okay, so first I want to explain how these statistics are both true. Now, we could say that a new drug reduced cancer incidence by 50%, and that sounds amazing, and it is, right? A new drug reduced cancer incidence by 50%. That's awesome, okay? Does that mean everybody should go get that drug and it should be required for everybody? Because obviously that's gonna reduce cancer by 50%. Not necessarily, okay? Because if we're talking about this, we need to recognize whether we're talking about relative risk or absolute risk, okay? And so when we talk about relative risk, we're looking in the situation situation that we're dealing with. But absolute risk talks about the big picture, okay? So the big picture is, in real numbers, how many people got cancer, okay? At first, two, and the people that took the medication got one, so that's an in, only a decrease of one less person got cancer, okay? Now, every life, life matters, and so that drug did successfully save a life, right? We've reduced cancer. But that doesn't mean that 50% of cancer is going to go away. You have to look into the context of what we're talking about. So let's stick with this kind of negative topic when we're talking about cancer. Uh, and let's look at an example. And we're kind of connecting our counting tables with that idea of relative versus absolute, taking into context. So the first question says, suppose a patient has a positive mammogram, 
That's what it says. Suppose a patient. So if we look at our table, where are the positive mammograms going to show up? They're going to show up right in this row. So we focus on whatever row or column we're talking about. And then the next thing we do is we say, what section of that column do we want? And it says, what is the chance that she really has cancer? Okay. So cancer, when we say cancer, in this case, we're going to use the word malignant as interchangeable for cancer. That's not necessarily a one for one, but I wanted to use it anyway. And so what you'll notice is we've got that column and that row. And so we're going to use the 85 that's in both for our numerator, 85. And we're going to divide it by our total. But we're not talking about the absolute. We're not talking about the big picture, okay? So don't put 10,000 on the bottom. When we talk about total, we need to say, well, total of what? Total of the context. We said, first off, they have a positive mammogram. So the total that has a po positive mammogram is right there, okay? So the total needs to be the context total. And if we go ahead and type that in, we're going to get our percent, okay? Let's look at another one. It says, what is the chance of a positive mammogram? What is the chance of a positive mammogram given that the patient has cancer? Cancer. So what is my context? Is my context that they have a positive mammogram or that they have cancer? It says given, which is kind of our give, given is our given. Given is our giveaway for what we're looking at here. It says given that the patient has cancer. So that means we're going to start by looking right here. And it says, what is the chance of a positive mammogram? And so a positive mammogram is going to be right there. And so we can go ahead and answer our question with, again, 85. But our denominator this time is out of 100. Suppose a patient has a negative mammogram. Okay. So in our third example, suppose our patient has a negative mammogram. So I'm going to go to negative mammograms, and this is our category that we're dealing with. This is our context. And then it says, what is the chance that they have cancer? And so we're going to look for, well, that's just 15 people out of how many? Well, out of the 8,575 patients. So when we do these, what we're going to do is we're going to look and make sure we're paying attention to the context. It's not always what comes first. Uh, notice that in this one, it's not what came first. It told us given gives us our context. I want to show you one more problem before I cut for the day. Okay, check this out. These are numbers in order. Okay, it's kind of hard to see that they're in order, but I want you to notice they kind of go down this way and then then down in the second, down, down, down. Okay, so we can kind of see that they're in order. And what we have here is we've got a request. It says, go ahead and find Q2, Q1, and Q3. So first off, it puts them in a weird order. Why did it say Q2 first? Well, Q2 is what we're gonna find first. Q2 is the, the median or the second quartile. So the median is our middle number. So if we kind of look in, in order, what we'll see is our middle number is going to be 480. That's the number exactly in the middle. If we look for Q1, what we're looking for is the lower quartile. And so that's like the median of the lower half. So if we look, this one's kind of tough, but if we go one, two, three, uh, our middle is going to be 420 on the lower half. Okay, it's halfway, it's, it's the middlest number on the lower half. Okay, right about there. And then for Q3, when we look at the middle number on the upper half, we look at the middle number on the upper half, which one are we gonna see? And so I think what we're going to see is one, two, three, four, five, six. I think I think it's kind of in between these two right here because I got four numbers here and four numbers here, kind of in between those two. So I might say that is 600, okay? 
So we're trying to choose to find the lower quartile and upper quartile and the median. The following statistics represent weekly salaries at a construction company. So I want you to be able to maneuver with these statistics and we can do that a few different ways. The first way is to, you should recognize most common. When we say most common, what we're looking for is the mode. Okay. So if I want to know the most common one, I didn't just need to pick the mode. Let's say I asked you a different question though. What if I asked you the 50% of people earn less than blank? What would you put? Well, that's not about what most people make. That's about what what's most common, but what about where is the middle? Okay. And so that's where we're going to talk about median. A few other things we could do is I could say uh, the top 75% of people earn blank. Okay, the top 75% of people. Now, you might notice 75% is not here. Okay, so the top 75% of people, I do see three, two things that are useful. We got the first quartile. Quartile, remember, it tells us where that's 25%, but that's less that way. And this one is going to be the 75% and less that way. But I didn't ask for the top 75%. Neither of those tell me the top 75% except if the bottom 25% makes at most 400, then what we can say about the top 75% is they earn more than 400. 75% of people earn more than $400 per week. Now we should do this at least once. We should do this frequency table. So the way this works is we're gonna build a frequency table and we're going to calculate the relative frequency and the cumulative frequency. So we've got our data up top. And what I'm going to do is first, I'm just going to make tally marks and build my frequency table with tallies. So I'm going to look 74, 74. I'm going to cross it off and I'm going to put a mark, a tally between 70 and 75. 72 also goes there, 89, 66, 97, 77, 69. 66, 96, 72, 82, 71, 98, 70, 64, 92, 85, 99, 76, 87. And so I end up with 4, 2, three, two, five, and four. Okay, and so those are my frequencies. Uh, how many times do we have a score in that range? And so we have it. What is my total amount of frequencies? Well, if I add those all up, one, two, three, four, I end up with 20, okay? So when I do my relative frequency, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do four divided by 20, or two divided by 20 or three divided by 20 and convert that to a percent. And so four divided by 20 is 20%, 10%, 15%, 10%, 25%, and 20%. Now, double check that our relative frequency adds up to, uh, yeah, it actually adds up to exactly 100, that's perfect. Now, when we talk about cumulative frequency, cumulative means how many do we have in this category? or how many do we have in this category or any category before it? So we say in the first category, there's four, right? But in the second category, there's four plus two. There's the two in that category and the four that came before it. So we get six. In the next category, there's three plus the six that we already had, so nine. And then we have two plus the nine we already had, so 11. We have five plus the 11 we already had, so 16. And we have four plus the 16 we already had, which is 20. And the good news is we were supposed to add up to 20. So I like that. The distance you drive is proportional to the amount of gas you, you used. Now, proportional just means that we're going to be consistent. It's always going to be the same amount. 
as far as increase. So driving 132 miles uses six gallons of gas. So 132 miles uses six gallons of gas. Assume you've already driven 100 miles. Okay, so first off, that's the most confusing part about this. Already driven 100 miles means that at zero gallons used, we've already driven 100 miles. So it's like we started a trip, we drove 100 miles, and then we filled up with gas. Okay, so we're still at zero. We've used no gas. We have a full tank, but we have already gone 100 miles. The next thing it says, after six gallons, how far have we gone? Well, six gallons can get us 132 miles, but we're not going to put 132 because we have to add what we already had. So we're going to write 232. After 12 gallons, that's another six gallons, then we have to add the 132 again. And so that's going to give us 364. We got to do it one more time because they're going to ask us one more time, and that gives us 496. Determine which order pairs satisfy the given equation. Okay, so there's three order pairs. What we're going to do is we're going to recognize that the first number in each one is an X, and the second number is a Y. And if they satisfy the equation, that means if I plug them in, I should get something that's true. So we're going to try that. The first number I'm going to plug in is 6 fifths. I'm going to plug that in for X. So it's 5 times 6 fifths minus 3 times 0 equals 6. Well, what do I get? I get 6 equals 6. Does 6 equal 6? Yes. So that works. I can try 3 comma 3. And what would I get if I calculated that out? I get 15 minus 9, which is 6, and the other side is also 6. So that works out. So both of those work. Let me try the last one here because we can pick more than one answer on this one, and we've already picked two. Maybe it's all three of them. So when we do the last one, we see 5 times, well, x is 0 this time, minus mm -hmm. 3 mm -hmm. times negative 5 this time equals 6. And obviously this one, well, that gives us something like 15 equals 6. Does 15 equal 6? No. So this is not our answer. So we can say, not this one, but the other two work just fine. Find the slope. Now the slope is the change of y over change of x. In other words, we're going to say delta y over delta x is our slope. And so we're just going to say, how much did the y change from negative 10 to 9? It went up 19. Okay. So the change was up 19. And from 2 to negative 3, how much did the x change? It went down 5. We're going to simplify that a little bit. I'm just going to put negative 19 over 5 because it doesn't simplify much. And that's my slope. An airplane's altitude declined steadily by 27,600 feet over a 16-minute period. Find the rate of change. So altitude per minute is what we want, the rate of change. So that means per minute. We're going to put minutes on the bottom. So we're going to say 27,600 feet over a 16 minute period. And all we have to do is divide that because per minute means we wanna go ahead and say, yeah, how much would it be on average for just one minute? So once you type that in your calculator, you're gonna get an answer and that is the final answer. For the spring semester, let's say, uh, part-time students at a certain community college paid 442 per credit, okay? But they also paid a fee of $30 per semester. So if we we're going to come up with an equation for this, we'd say the tuition or total that they're going to pay is the $442 plus that $30 fee. But the problem with that is notice that that's just two numbers added together. Okay. So we actually have a linear model here where we have something that varies. They're not all going to pay the same amount because the more classes you take, the more you're going to pay. And so our linear model has to make sure we choose which one we're going to multiply. As it increases, we're not increasing the student fee. We're just increasing the tuition cost, which means we have a slope right there. And that's showing us the increase or the cost per credit. Water is steadily pumped out of a flooded basement. Let V be the volume in water. And so we've got this graph. So the first question is, how much water is in the basement after, uh, let's just say, after X hours of pumping, okay? So let me give you one. Let me say after 
six hours of pumping. After six hours of pumping, how much water? So we go to that and we see, oh, six hours of pumping is right there. That matches up with 4,000 gallons left over. There's a lot of water in there. After how many hours of pumping will thousands of gallons, will, will 1,000 <laughs> 1, gallon remain? Okay, so this one's a bit tougher, but if we notice this is linear, where would 1,000 be? It wouldn't be right there, because that'd be 2,000. It'd be right halfway between right there. So we're gonna say after how many hours? Six hours and 45 minutes, is what I'm gonna say, or 6.75 hours. How much water was in the basement before any was pumped out? So after zero hours of pumping, we had 28,000 gallons. After how many hours of pumping will the water be pumped out? So when do we get to zero? And it looks like after seven hours will be empty. Maybe not dry, but definitely empty. Let V be the value of a car when it is T years old. Some pairs of uh, values of T and V are listed in the following table. So we have T's and V's, and we want to create a scattergram of this data. Now I'm going to tell you right now, what is a scattergram? A scattergram is a plot that shows what's happening in this data. And so this scattergram might look something like this. I want you to notice a few things about scattergrams. They're not always going to line up perfectly. Okay, and we can actually make scattergrams by going into Excel. Oh, that's not how you spell Excel. Uh, Excel, or we can use Desmos. And either one allows us to take a table of values and graph them as dots. Okay, the reason I like Excel a little bit better is because we can also say add a trend line. And the trend line is the line in the scattergram that goes in the middle of all your dots. Notice it, it doesn't actually have to hit any of the dots, but it's supposed to kind of minimize the deviations. Let's say we have a hip hop band they're playing and the venue that they're playing at charges $6 at the door. That's their cover charge. Um, but then the venue is also going to make money for every drink that they sell, for every Mountain Dew. So if each Mountain Dew costs $2, then every time somebody buys a drink, they're going to make $2, right? So let's look at the total cost for you to go to this concert. It could be pretty cheap. It could be if you spend no money, okay, uh, or if you drink no drinks, it's still going to cost you $6. So if you spend $0 on drinks, your total cost is still $6. But if you spend $2 on drinks, your total cost is, well, 6 plus 2. If you spend $3, it's 6 plus 3, or 6 plus 4, or 6 plus 5. And so the pattern really is that it's always going to be that 6, but then we add the cost we're paying in, in drinks. Use the slope intercept form to graph the equation. It's not in slope intercept form, so the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 2x from both sides. And I get y equals negative 2x plus 1. My slope is negative 2. My y-intercept is 1. So I'm going to start by graphing my y-intercept. I'm going to go to 1. And then I'm going to move according to my slope. It says go down 2. 1, 2. And then I can't just put a point there. I need to move over. So if we don't have a denominator that tells us rise over run. We just move over one. So I'm going to put my second point right there, and then I'm going to connect my dots. Decide whether the following statement makes sense. When I graphed a linear function, it turned out to be a wavy curve. Does that make sense? No. Linear functions are lines, particularly straight lines. You run along a path at a constant speed of 2.4 miles per hour, okay? So you're going just straight 2.4 miles per hour. So after one hour, one hour of running, 
you've gone 2.4 miles, right? If we stop right here, we'd be at 2.4 miles, but you kept running. You actually ran an extra bit. So you actually ran longer than that. And so this is gonna be not too bad because when we do rates, what we're saying is, I already know the rate, 2.4 miles per hour, and I'm traveling from one hour, it'd be 2.4, but I'm traveling for 1.3 hours. And so that's gonna give me, that's gonna give me my distance, my total distance. Okay, and you could also do it with the 2.4 and the 3.4 hours and multiply them together to get your distance. A snowplow has a maximum speed of 35. It can't go can't go more than 35 because it's probably got like safety features and also it's a snowplow, so it's very big. It, it does get slower though. As the snow increases, the snowplow has to go slower to re remain in control and do a good job of snowing or plowing the snow. So at what snow depth will the snowplow be unable to move? So let's let's run some numbers here. First off, if there is, uh, let's say, depth of snow was zero. So if there's zero snow, what is my speed? I'm going to use, let's use S for speed. That's, that's an S, okay? Then we'd be going 35 miles per hour. The follow-up would be, what if there was one inch of snow? Now, according to what it says up here, it says its speed decreases 1.5 miles for every inch. So we're going to take that 35 we had minus 1 times 1.5. We could keep doing this, and we could put 5 inches of snow, and we just calculate it the same way. We would have to say the S is 35 minus, well, this time it's 5 times 1.5. And so we actually have a linear model here. We have a linear model where S equals... 35 minus 1.5 times the depth of snow. The cost of publishing a poster is 4,000 just for setting it up. But then each po poster costs you $4. So if you were to try to print just one poster, it would cost you $4,004. This is a linear function. It's a linear function because we have a rate per that's a straight line and we also have a startup cost okay and so our function could be said to be y equals 4x plus 4,000. now the independent what what's going to be determining your cost is how many posters you have so that's your independent the number of posters you print and then the more posters you print, the more it's going to cost you. So that's your dependent variable. That depends on the number of posters. Use the slope-intercept form to graph the equation. It's not in slope-intercept form. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 2x from both sides. And I get y equals negative 2x plus 1. My slope is negative 2. My y-intercept is 1, so I'm going to start by graphing my y-intercept. I'm going to go to 1, and then I'm going to move according to my slope. It says go down 2, 1, 2. And then I can't just put a point there. I need to move over. So if we don't have a denominator that tells us rise over run, we just move over 1. So I'm going to put my second point right there, and then I'm going to connect my dots. Finding the equation of the line that contains the given point and is perpendicular. So first off, uh, when we have this line, a line that's perpendicular has not the same slope. The slope of this one is negative 11, but a perpendicular line has the slope of 1 over positive 11, okay? So a perpendicular slope has the opposite reciprocal slope, which means I want an equation like y equals mx plus b but i want my m because i want it to be perpendicular to that one to be 1 over 11. okay that's great and all but i still don't know what b would be now since we were told it has to match that point right there then we know in x and y we can plug in so i'm going to just plug those in for x and y make sure you put the x with the x and the y with the y so that's going to be 11 equals 1 over 11 times negative 10 plus b. 
And if we're going to go ahead and solve that, then I get 11 equals negative 10 over 11 plus b. 11 plus 10 over 11 equals b. And so b equals 11 point, what is, that's like 11.9. Okay, I rounded a little bit there. So what does that mean? That means I can now write my equation as y equals, I probably shouldn't use decimals. Let me let me be more precise. So that's 131 over 11. I just multiplied 11 times 11 and added it to 10. So I'm going to leave it as a fraction just to be more precise. And I get my equation. Let P be the percentage of dentistry degrees earned by women, okay? So T equals zero actually represents the year 1970. And so it says, hey, try to create a scattergram, but we have to change a couple things about this. Um, one is we want we don't want to graph the X to be 1970. We want to change this up. So I'm going to have another column here. We're going to do this in Excel because remember, we can do scattergrams in Excel. And so in my first column, I have the years and then I have percents, but I'm going to put a column in between there, which is my T. It says the T for 1970 should be zero, 1980 should be 10 and so forth. So we should get 20, 30, 40. And it says create a scattergram. And so we're going to select these two and we're going to go to insert scatter plot. And then because it wants to draw a line, when we look at that scatter plot of all those dots, we're also going to make sure we insert a trend line. And that insert trend line might be under add chart elements. The average length of a six year old fish is 27 inches. Um, and this is a linear model. So we say a six year old fish. So year six and length is 27. So the next one it says is, well, we got a 21 year old fish and that's 54.3. So what it says is try to come up with a good formula here. Okay. Find an equation of a linear model. So what I want to do is actually, uh, we could do this in Excel. And the way we do this is we put these in and we insert scatter plot. Okay. And then we insert our trend line. There's a bunch of other features that we can use in Excel to make this happen, especially if they were to ask us more questions like predicting certain things. We could use things like the equation forecast, which allows us to just select those and then tell it what numbers we want to put in to guess about. OK, but this is a good way to get started and it allows us to then look at that trend line and see where the data would go in. Desmos also handles this. All right. If we put this in Desmos as a table. And then we use the formula Y and then squiggly M X plus B. It will graph the line and then it'll be right on there. And it's very easy to manip manipulate. The catch is we need to make sure the Y that we have here, like Y one or X one matches the Y one and X one in the table. The rate at which a cricket chirps depend on the temperature. It is possible to estimate the air temperature by counting chirps, theoretically. So what we can do is we can look at the table and we can try to graph this and find an equation that matches this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that table and put it in Excel. Once we have it in Excel, what we're going to do is we're going to insert a scatter plot. And then we're going to insert a trend line. And that'll give us a scatter plot with the trend line that should get, get us an idea of whether this actually works, whether this actually makes a linear function. Now, if we needed to forecast and do things like that, we can use formulas like equals forecast 
okay? Or we can simply look at our scatter plot and see where that trend line would take us. Calculate the amount of money you'll have at the end of the indicated time period. So let's say you started with 3,000 and we pay simple interest. So that means I give you 3% for 10 years. So what is 3%? We have A equals P times R, 1.03. So I'm going to make the 3% into that decimal. And then we need to do that 10 times. Okay, so since it says simple interest, when I get that, what is 3% of 3,000? Well, 3% of 3,000 is... Let's see, I'm gonna type it in my calculator, make sure I get it right. 90. So I'd make $90 a year. And so since they're paying simple interest, I'm just gonna make $90 times 10 years. So I would make $900. It says how much money you'll have. So we won't have 900, we'll have the money we started with plus that 900. So simple interest, we find the interest for that first year, and then we just multiply that by however many years we have, because we're going to make the same amount of interest each year. Use the compound interest formula to determine the accumulated balance after the stated period. So let's try a few things on this one. So first we have the 8,000 invested. We have an APR of 8% and for five years. APR is annual. Okay. So... They haven't told us how often we're going to compound this, so let's assume we're going to compound it annually. Okay, so we have the amount we started with, 8,000, and we're going to multiply it by 1 plus that 8%. And we're going to do that five times. So I'm going to put the 5 as an exponent. And what you'll get when you do this is notice that 8% and that 1 look a little ugly when we do that. So I'm going to switch it to a single number to show you that what we have is 1.08. And as we multiply it by 1.08 five times, we're going to get a little bit more interest each time. And so if we were to plug that into our calculator, it would give us our compound interest compounded annually. Use the appropriate compound interest formula. Now, this one actually says... We have 3,000 invested for 18 years, and we have an APR. That is an annual APR, means annual interest rate. And then it says compounded monthly. So we need to do a slight change to our formula. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to keep our $3,000, and then we're going to multiply that by our 1 plus our rate. But our rate, our rate has to take into account that it's not a monthly rate. So we're gonna take that 6%, which is annual, and we have to divide it by however many months there are. How many months are in a year? There are 12 months in a year. And then up top, we need to raise it to however many months we have. So rather than just writing 18, we're gonna write 18 times 12. Because we have to account for the fact that we're gonna calculate interest, not 18 times, but 18 times 12 times. From here, we can clean it up a little bit by saying, well, that's 3,000, and the 6% divided by 12 plus 1 is going to be 1.005 to the 12 times 18. I'm going to try to do that math in my head. Hold on. That may or may not be right. And then that should give me my answer. Describe the basic difference between linear growth and exponential growth. First off, uh, linear growth goes up in a line and exponential growth is curved. That's the first thing. In other words, the rate of change is constant. So if I tell you I've got an investment that's going to make you $100 a year, then every year you'd expect to make $100. So that's like saying plus $100 each year. So every year you make $100. But I told you I got an investment that's going to make you 10% per year. Then what we have is in money, in actual money, 
then the change is changing, okay? Because I'm making a percent of my money, then the first year I make 10%, but then the second year I don't have the same amount, so I make 10% of a different amount. So the change is changing. And so that's one of the big differences with linear and exponential growth. The one that grows faster in the long run and gets really big numbers is that exponential growth. Human population has been growing exponentially for a few centuries. Do you expect this to go on forever? Okay. Do we expect to keep on going forever? What do you think? Well, I mean, eventually we would run out of room, wouldn't we? And I think that's when we, in the 80s, there was a bunch of movies about overpopulation. People were scared that we were going to get so many people because the population was growing so fast. But the truth is that eventually it starts to balance out because we run out of resources in space. Eventually we would run out of food for everyone. And we're already, you know, depending on your perspective, we're already getting closer to that point. So if we start to run out of resources, what we're going to see is it's not going to grow exponentially forever. It's going to start to balance out. The other thing is we do have some ups and downs. For example, when we have a pandemic, that might change how that graph looks. Considering this case of exponential growth, okay? So you start with 1100 per month and you get annual raises of 6% per year. So we could first write a function and they, they tell us the way we write this exponential function, we say Q equals our original salary, 1100 times one plus R to the T. Now R is our growth rate. And so our growth rate in this case is 6%. Now, if we were to use this function, we could figure out things like in the year three years in, how much will we make? Will we still make 1100? No, because we've gotten a raise. So what we can do is we can plug it into this formula. Eleven hundred times one point oh six to the third power, and that would give me your salary after year three. Suppose the rate of return for a particular stock during the past two years was five percent and thirty-five percent, five percent and thirty-five percent. Compute the geometric mean rate of return. Okay, so a couple things here. One, it says the rate of return of five percent. Write that as point oh five and thirty-five percent as 0.035 or 0.35 sorry and if we just calculated the geometric mean we could do that with excel we could say equals geo mean and put those in parentheses and it would calculate the answer but we would actually get the wrong answer here okay because just like when we look at any of the other uh interest or growth formulas what we actually need to put is one plus r so instead of writing 1.05, uh, we need to write 1.05 or 1.35. And then when we calculate geometric mean using either geo mean formula or simply multiplying them together, A times B, and then square rooting them, then we should get the right answer. For the data in this accompanying table, it's asking us to calculate geometric mean. Okay, Each one of these, though, is given to us as a percentage. Okay, it doesn't say very clearly, but it says in the problem in percentages. So each one of these I want you to think of as a percentage. So that means I also need you to think about the fact that when we're doing things with percentages and growing rates, we always use one plus R. Okay, one plus R. So that means 8.61 is actually, if I'm just looking at A, 8.61 is actually 1.0861 because that's 8.61% plus one and so if we you were to take all those numbers and take that same process one plus five five nine one point one zero 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 and one point one eight five one what you get is you get the rates in a way that we can deal with okay because the next thing we want to do is calculate geometric mean you can do it two ways i like to use excel so i'm going to say equals geo mean that's the formula you geo mean and then we just need to type in the four numbers and it'll give us the answer only if we've already converted them appropriately the other way to do it is to take geo mean just means to take the root of the product 
So we're going to take each of those numbers and multiply them together. And then we're going to fourth root. Why am I fourth rooting? Because the one, two, three, four numbers, it has to match the index. So if we're taking the geometric mean of two numbers, we just need the square root. If we're taking the geometric mean of four numbers, we have to fourth root. Compute the total and annual returns on the following investment, 17 years after purchasing shares in a mutual fund for 5,900. So they paid 5,900 and then they sold for 11,100. They made some money, okay? So we're going to, how much money did they make? We're just gonna subtract how much they put in and that'll give us our total amount made. So it looks like they made about $5,200. That's pretty good. But we need to calculate the fact that they made $5,200 um, over 17 years. So there's a little bit more math to do. But what you need to do is recognize that that's not the total return. That's the total return in dollars. But if we wanted to do the total return in percent, we'd have to say, well, 5200 divided by the original investment. And that would give us their return on their investment. But again, that's not taking into account that it happened over 17 years. So when we get our investment, we need to take into account that it happened over 17 years, which means there's two ways we can do it. I think what we should do is we should do the geometric mean, okay? In other words, we're gonna take the 17th root of our gain there and that should give us what we're looking for so if we take one plus let's figure out what this final number would be 5200 divided by 5900 so that's 0.88 let's say one or 88.1 percent that's a good return. That means that's one plus 88.1%. So that means we're gonna take the 17th root, the 17th root of 1.881, and let's see what we get. If you don't have a calculator that can do 17th root, that's something that you might come across, then what you can do is you can actually use exponents and the 17th root is the same as saying 1.881 to the 117th. So some calculators can't do 17th root, but they can handle exponents like that. And so according to my calculation, I got the number of about 3.8% return annually. Find the average price of a home in a town was 177,000 in 2007, but it's been rising 5% per year. So the exponential function, it tells us this is what we need to do. So we're going to type that in as Q equals, well, the original 177,000 times one plus the rate. So I'm going to write that as 1.05 and then plus we put the T as the exponent. Great, so we have it. Now we can use this to calculate. Now, obviously we put year zero, then it's obviously 17700. But let's say we wanted to fast forward to the year 2021, okay? So then we're gonna type in 2021. 20, How many years is that? Well, that's 2021, what year is that? And T's, that's 14. So that's T equals 14. So at the year 2021, T equals 14, what would we expect the price of the home to be? Well, we're gonna use the formula we have and we're gonna plug it in. I'm gonna try this and see what it comes out to be. I think it's gonna be a big number. Houses are expensive. And I raise it to the 14th power and I get Three five zero four four seven eight nine three one. I got my decimal right here. So it looks like if I were to 
Yeah, it looks like the housing price is like doubled in 14 years. And that is it for me on this problem.